Okay, let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study together. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit that teaches us. And we're thankful for your word that's been given as guidance as well. Uh, Lord, as we uh, look again at Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, we ask that you can direct our minds, our thoughts, that you can give us insight, and that we can understand the message that you have for us today. Uh, may your Holy Spirit be our teacher, and uh, may we be able to reflect Christ's character to all that we come in contact with today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, and uh, we're going to continue to study in Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, just to sort of finish off uh, where we were last time, I redrew uh, a drawing of the sanctuary. So this is obviously a very rough drawing of Solomon's temple. And we had talked about uh, the fact, here's the brazen altar, and, and I've seen different depictions of how Solomon temp, Solomon's temple is laid out, but there is this gate here at the north, and this is called the altar gate. And this is the gate where the animals would be brought in to be slaughtered. So that's uh, the idea of this north gate. And we know that there's this image of jealousy here um, by this gate. Right. So obviously there's more furniture and different things here. Now, as, as far as the directions, when we were dealing with uh, the layout of the Israelites, uh, the camp of the Israelites around the sanctuary, so this wouldn't have been in Solomon's time, this would have been in, in the wilderness, um, we had uh, these banners, an ox over here, um, and, and the different tribes. So this was, um, trying to remember it all. I know Dan was up here and this was an eagle. And um, this was Judah over here. And this is a lion. And uh, this was a man. And this was, hmm. Does anybody remember who we had on this side and on this side, the different tribes? On the west was Ephraim. Ephraim here? In the west. On the west would be Ephraim, okay. I knew one of them is Ephraim. And I'm trying to remember who was at the bottom. Reuben. Reuben, that's it, yes. Okay, so these are, and then there would have been uh, other tribes as well, but these were the ones that were to the north, south, east, and west directly in relationship to the sanctuary. Now, um, in Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, just as in Ezekiel chapter 1, we have uh, directions that are, are the directions of the compass that are referred to. Now, I was thinking about this and trying to understand um, why this is in the north. And, and some of the commentaries and different people have a suggestion that this is where Babylon comes from the north. Uh, we know that the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, in the sanctuary, you have the table of showbread, and then you have uh, the candlestick here on, on the south side, so the table's on the north side. Uh, you have the altar of incense over here, just before the before the veil, and then of course you have the ark here in the center of the most holy place. Um, and this image, the suggestion is, is that this is uh, Astart or Ishtar. Um, so this image over here would be. Uh, which we would think of as Ishtar, that's how we're more, more commonly referred to it, uh, which uh, 
would also be Venus. Now, the date that Ezekiel um, is writing this chapter that was given to us was uh, the sixth year. So it's the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day. And I always wished it was the sixth day because then you would have this 666 symbol. Um, but it isn't. So it's just like that. Now we have this as September 7th, 591 BC. Now today is September 7th, so uh, kind of interesting. But uh, September 7th, 591 BC. And, and what I did is I, I went to that uh, Stellarium program and I looked at the sky and to see what the constellation was at that time. So the sun is in Virgo in this month, in this in September, um, which of course is same now. Um, but Venus itself is on uh, the, um, the left side. And the left side is considered the north. That is, if you're facing east, and we learned this when we studied chapter one, that if you talk about the north, the word for north is left side, and the word for south is right side. So when this is on the north, this is on the left side, and if you look at the constellation Virgo, Venus is on the left side, uh, just on the lower part here, down by, by the hip. And I'm not sure what that means, other than we know that uh, uh, Virgo or the Virgin in Revelation 12 represents God's people or the church. And of course, the church is also represented by the sanctuary. But it could be that uh, this is just an indication of the time that he's in. So the date that he's in, um, he can see this sort of symbolic representation. And, and as we know, Ezekiel is attack upon uh, Babylonian mysticism, which had come into uh, Judah. So the Jews are in Babylonian captivity, uh, but they also are worshiping Babylonian gods. And so Ishtar is one of them. And, and as we go through this, we'll even deal with Tammuz and, and also sun worship. So all of these depictions, all of these uh, symbols that are being used, to us, they're unfamiliar. Uh, some of them are familiar, but we, we do, wouldn't understand them as well as the people in that day would understand them. So they would see much more clearly uh, that Ezekiel in his vision, that this is a direct um, attack upon their false worship. We have to spend a bit more time to try to understand that because we're not as familiar with uh, the gods of, of, the, of, of that time, of the Babylonians. Now, I remember reading um, the book, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And, and some of that book has been discredited, but I mean, I wouldn't say all of it has been. Um, just because back then he had not as much information um, as we have. And I spelled Ephraim wrong. Um, uh, one of the things that, that modern scholarship tends to downplay is this idea that there's this resurrection, dying and resurrected God. Um, and, and I'm not sure that, that I agree with that. I think that, that definitely that idea existed. Um, it definitely wasn't the, the, the root of how Christianity came about. Christianity isn't some kind of modification of sun worship. Um, sun worship is a modification of true worship. So it's a counterfeit. Um, so when we look at uh, the different gods and goddesses, some of them are depicted in the sky. That is, they're seen as operating in the sky. And the different stories they have about their gods often has to do with how they see these uh, gods or beings moving about in relationship to the sun and the planets and to the seasons. 
and they believed that somehow a worship of these gods produced the seasons. So there was this, this belief, um, and it's, it's a type of nature worship where uh, the actions of man can sort of dictate God, the, the actions of the gods, and also that the actions of gods uh, is a response into what man has done and sort of dictates God's judgments against us. So, so these ideas were really prevalent in, in Babylon, and the Jews uh, bought into some of this thinking. So this idea that there's this image of jealousy in the sanctuary, in the, well, not the sanctuary itself, but in the temple, Solomon's temple, and, um, and as we're going to see that, you know, women are going to be weeping for Tammuz outside this gate, and Tammuz is the, uh, the counterpart of Ishtar, so that's the man, and uh, Tammuz is a, a god of, of the seasons, that is, he's a spring god, and he dies in the summer when it's hot and things don't grow. So, uh, and that's why the fourth month of the Jewish year, which uh, would align with uh, uh, July, is, um, is the month of Tammuz. So that's where they weep in, in the fourth month for the month of Tammuz. So, so we have all these different um, symbols of, of chronology, of time, of the sky, of the sun and the moon and the stars, uh, which in Babylonian worship, they're trying to control. But we know that God ultimately is in control. He, he, he's the one who created everything and he set it all in order. And this is his time clock uh, that he has created. And it's not something that man uh, can change. Man can't change uh, the times and the seasons. And, and that's what man thinks to do with sun worship. We know that's what the Catholic work, uh, ch Catholic Church seeks to do with Sunday worship. So this is the layout that we have here in uh, in chapter eight. This this idea of this image here, and by placing this uh, way that it was set out, um, we can see that Dan Dan is one in Revelation. Um, chapter five or chapter seven, uh, Dan is taken out of the 12 tribes. Now we know that uh, the symbol here uh, is the eagle. It's also the serpent uh, in Jewish tradition. And this is Scorpio, right? This is the scorpion. So Scorpio is this um, sign here. And this, this is Aquarius and this is Taurus and this is Leo the lion, um, if you're going to look at it as the constellations. Now, of course, we think as the constellations having to do with astro astrology, uh, but astrology and astronomy um, were, in a sense, the same. I mean, observing the sky, whether or not you thought it had magic powers, you're still observing the movements of the stars of the seasons. And so the difference between astronomy as we would understand it now, and astrology as it was practiced in Babylon, has to do with one of perspective. Is God in control um, of everything? Is he the creator? Or is nature somehow um, in control? And is man's interaction with nature of worshiping these things of nature, is that going to somehow change our destiny? So there's definitely a, a counterfeit that exists in astrology of of taking what God has created and perverting it. Because God tells us he, that he gave us the sun and the moon and the stars for times and for seasons for, and for days and years, for signs, seasons, days and years. So, um, so this is what we have uh, to look at as we're going through chapter eight. And um, we're gonna see how this applies later as we go through other chapters. So I'm going to share uh, my screen here and we're going to look at this again 
and go into the four abominations. So we had seen this glory of the Lord and we had seen this image of jealousy. And we know that he has seen the vision that he had seen at the beginning, which is the glory of the God of Israel. And we had a lot of discussion last time about um, uh, the Mara vision. And, and I'm going to come back to that, um, not right away, but I'm going to come back to it later on um, when we get into some of the other chapters um, in addressing that again. But we know that we need to see, we need to have a revelation of Christ. And we can see this parallel between the different um, visions, the visions of John, the visions of Isaiah, um, and, uh, and all of these, uh, and Daniel. So we can see that these things are all pointing to uh, that Christ is the one who is in charge of everything. And, and this is not about uh, these fake gods, these false gods um, are just, contingent beings they're just they're they're something that um uh they're not the creator so there is the creator now they're not real gods uh but they're man's ideas about what gods are so people think of the things of nature are to be worshipped rather than the god who created them so in verse five it says uh then said he unto me son of man lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north so i lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So it would seem to me that as far as his location is concerned, he would be in the center of the inner courtyard uh, by the brazen altar. That's where he would be situated as he's looking at this scene, because he's looking toward the north. And, and there he sees this image of jealousy in the entry. And he said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. So we, we address this image of jealousy that it's, it's Ishtar. That's what most people say that it probably is based upon uh, the history and also the context of of what's being described dealing with the woman weeping for Tammuz that we're going to see. Now, this was always uh, the next one here in verse 7 and, and onward, the second abomination. This is the one that always fascinated me as a kid, and I'm not sure why. Um, but he brought me to the door of the court. So the door of the court, um, exactly where this is, we're not sh certain, but it seems like he's taken outside uh, to, the, to the outer court, courtyard and he's going to be looking in uh, to, some, to a room on the side of the temple building. So, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. So there's this hole in the wall. And then said he unto me, me son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. So there's this hole, he's gonna dig, and then he's going to find this door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. And so I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Now, when we think about this, at least when I think about it and, and some other people, uh, we get this idea of how you would see um, in an Egyptian uh, tomb or an Egyptian temple where there's all this art, all these uh, drawings. Now, when we look at uh, these Egyptian drawings, obviously some of them are hieroglyphics, but some are the depictions of um, the different gods in, in different ways. Obviously, if you see a really big being and a little being, the big being's more important. At least that's how we've always looked at it. Now, there is a, an Egyptologist, Gerard Gerteau, who um, has studied these uh, drawings that are on the ceilings of Egyptian tombs. And he has demonstrated that they actually refer to the date that the person died. Um, 
now they're so they're a depiction of the sky and and you can tell by the different sizes of the gods and the different layout uh, what actually the constellations would have looked like at that moment that person died and by doing that you can actually date uh, the death of that particular pharaoh um, just by the drawings on it, on the ceiling of his tomb. And this kind of reminds me of that. So uh, when it says that there's all these, um, uh, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall roundabout. Now this isn't on the ceiling, but this is on the wall, though it could include the ceiling. So it just include the surface. And I sort of uh, picture this as being like, like these Egyptian tombs with these drawings on all over everywhere uh, of, of the gods and the sky and the time. And it seems to me that what's being worshiped here is Babylonian mysticism and Babylonian astrology. So that, that's my take on it, whether that's correct or not. Um, I have no way of knowing. Now, uh, the other part, of this is we get to verse 11 and there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. So this would be the 70 elders. Later on, they have the Sanhedrin, which is made up of 70, 70 elders. And so this is the representation of God's people. Uh, they're the representatives. They're the, uh, I guess, political representative representation of the leadership of God's people. And they're involved in this worship. And in the midst of them stood Jehazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. So obviously they're worshiping uh, these idols, and these are the 70 men. And whether Jehazaniah, the son of Shaphan, is, is one of those 70, or whether it's 71, I, I don't know. Um, it could be that there's 70 men and, and, and that he's just the one in the midst of that group of 70 men, which is how I take it, that there's 70 altogether. And then he said unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Now, Ezekiel is is in vision, as we've talked about. He's not literally in Jerusalem. And what's actually happening literally in Jerusalem, whether this is actually occurring at that time, whether he's seen something that's, that's occurring at that moment, or whether it's just a symbolic representation, um, you know, I'm not certain about, but I would think uh, that he has seen something that's actually occurring. So that this type of worship uh, existed. Um, so God is showing him what's actually happening in the secret. In secret. But we know that this is also representing um, what every man is imagining. That is, it's in the chambers of his imagery. And that, that expression, um, obviously in Hebrew, they don't have a word um, that, that quite, you know, they don't have the same language as us and they don't quite have uh, some of the psychological words that we have. And so when you read in Hebrew, they, they use a, 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 a literal concrete language, but that has a lot of symbolic Im implications. So to talk about the chambers of his imagery, uh, this would be the imagination. I mean, we know that the imagination or the thoughts, you know, you could use the words thoughts, um, imagination or the thoughts of his heart were evil continually, if you remember that uh, from the story of Noah. Uh, but this here of imagery is not just thoughts. Um, I'm just going to bring up the Hebrew here. So this is referring to uh, this word imagery is a figure. Uh, so the chambers of his imagery which is an apartment chamber, um, and innermost is in other ways. Um, so figuratively, it's an ima the imagination. So it's, it's, uh, it's taking a literal idea, 
uh, figure and they use that as the word imagination. And of course, if you think about the word imagination, that's image-ation, right? Um, so even our word imagination has the idea that we can picture things with our mind. And, and I would think that if we're going to, to look at this, these are the secret sins, the things that are hidden within the human heart that maybe don't always come out in the actions where we think that God doesn't see. And, and I would think that that really would apply to, to Israel at that time, that even though they're going through these forms of worship, that really deep down inside, uh, their heart is full of worshiping idols. And we, we know that about um, ourselves. We know that about God's people throughout history. Uh, just because people are doing something on the outside uh, to look good, does it mean that they're good on the inside? Um, now, Stephen says the Sanhedrin were assemblies of either 23 or 71 elders. Okay. Um, yeah, and I did some research on the Sanhedrin. And you, you could be right, but there are differences of opinion about that and difference of, of how the Sanhedrin, when they first developed. Because um, a lot of the, that we have about the Sanhedrin comes from later rabbinic writings. So anyway, as far as these 70, whether it's 70 or 71, I don't know. I tend to take that it's 70 altogether, but it, it's not really that important. Um, so... The idea that God isn't seeing what's happening. Now, we're going to make an application of this to our time. And, and, we're, we're, and we already have in this movement. And we're going to basically make that same application. Uh, but we're going to try to see how it relates uh, to the message that we have to give uh, to Adventism. And then he said unto me, Turn ye thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which is towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. So um, this woman weeping for Tammuz, we're all familiar with this. Now, often we will associate this with Lent. And, and the reason that we do this is that... Um, uh, the season of Lent, which is connected with uh, Ishtar or Easter, at least that's how we generally uh, understand it. And I'm not sure if there's actually that direct connection um, linguistically, but that's how we've often seen it. Because um, I don't actually think the word Easter comes from the word Ishtar, even though that they sound similar. Because we actually can, can trace the word Easter itself uh, in English. And it doesn't, it doesn't come from Ishtar. But, but there still is a relationship there uh, between these worships. And um, we also see that there's these cakes. So everybody's familiar with uh, hot cross buns. And one of the things about Ishtar is that she's the god of, uh, the, the, the queen of heaven, right? And, and that is in, um, let's turn there, Jeremiah, if I can remember the verses. Uh, Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 44, verse 17 and 18. Yeah, so Jeremiah 44. And we had studied uh, Jeremiah 41 to 42. Um, and this is talking about uh, punishments that's going to come upon Jerusalem. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. So this is what God's people are saying. And to pour out drink offerings for her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense of the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings unto her. Did we make, um, did we make cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? So I'm not sure exactly what that all means. I could probably spend a bit of time, but the main point that we're talking about is these cakes of worship. 
So these, this, people associate this with hot cross buns and this queen of heaven uh, being Ishtar or Venus um, is, is, is this false worship that was practiced uh, by the Jews in Jerusalem. And in verse uh, 25, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye shall surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. So notice this reference now to Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, said the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, said the Lord, uh, saying, the Lord God liveth. Um, so anyway, there's this reference to Egypt, and that's because there's this worship that's also being influenced by Egypt, and there's people in the land of Egypt. So we know that there is... Um, these mixtures of these different worships or these different religions that have been influencing God's people. And at, at that time, Egypt hadn't yet been taken over by uh, the Babylonians. Um, that didn't take place until uh, about 20 some years later. So, so anyway, um, it would actually be more than that. It would be 30. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'd have to date this chapter here to know. Anyway, I'm trying to get to the point here that this worship is both Babylonian and Egyptian that is occurring. And these women weeping for Tammuz, this is related to this type of false worship. In trying to, to understand this in, in our context, we're going to see how that relates. Because often we just think of it dealing with Easter, but it's actually broader than that. It's broader, broader than just observing the wrong feast days. And then he said unto me in verse 15, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And then he said unto me, hast thou, um, and that, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah? that they commit the abominations which they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. So of course, this is the fourth abomination. And... So you're going to have the women weeping for Tammuz. You're going to have over here somewhere these hidden chambers. And, and then you're going to have here between the porch and the altar. So this is the porch. Here there's this porch. And this is the altar. So at the door, you're going to have 25 men. And they're going to be worshiping the sun towards the east, right? So they got, that, they got this sun worship going on. Now, in these four abominations, obviously we can see that this is addressing this, this false worship that is directly related to the heaven. We have the queen of heaven, Ishtar. We have Tammuz, who's the seasonal god, the god of um, the heart, the, the spring season. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and then we have all of these uh, this secret chambers, all these different idols that are being portrayed upon these walls, which represent what goes on in the, in the thoughts and the imagination of man. And so 
Man has turned away from God and he's gone to worship these other gods. Now, when we get to chapter 9, we're going to see, and, and 10 and 11, we're going to see how God addresses this in his judgment against these false gods. But part of what we already have seen in Ezekiel, if we go back, we know that Ezekiel has seen this depiction of the sky and, and these cherubim, and these cherubim end up carrying him um, in, in vision in, in, the, in, in chapter 3 uh, to sit there seven days um, symbolically in a period of consecration as a priest. And then he's going to give this message and he's going to give this time prophecy, which we've already seen. So now when we get to chapter eight, it's after this time prophecy has been given. And there's something about um, these dates and these representations that are actually pointing to the destruction that's going to come upon Jerusalem. And, and so we're going to see that as we go through Ezekiel, we'll start to notice that all these things that we've been studying are going to be addressed again and again. And that if we hadn't studied them, we wouldn't understand what's being referred to. Now, one of the things about Jerusalem is, uh, uh, and, and the siege and destruction of Jerusalem is there are dates attached to it. And these dates are important and we're going to see how these apply. Uh, we can actually go back once we get there we'll be able to go back to chapter eight and we'll see that there's a symbolic representation um, of these dates in, in, in what happens in these visions. So that these, these gods that are re referenced, uh, their locations uh, in, you know, north, south, east, or west, all these things are indications of the timing of events. Um, and that's what God wants to show them is that he's in control of the time, that he's in control of the times of the seasons and that it's not these gods. Um, so everything happens for a reason in Ezekiel and, and it's going to take us some time to get through, through that and to work through it and to see it. But even what we have happening here in, in the location of these, uh, these, abominations, but also the date in which he sees them. They're all connected. So I'm going to erase this now, and I'm going to deal with uh, how we have always looked at these uh, four abominations in this movement, uh, which is correct um, in, for the most part in how we see this. But we're going to be able to see a little bit more about it. So we see these as, as the four generations of Adventism or the four abominations of Adventism. And, and we also see them at the end. Now, I'm not uh, an expert on this. These are studies I've watched a long time ago. Um, but we can, we can line them up in this way where we have you know, the first abomination, we know that this is the image of jealousy. And what is this image of jealousy? How do we apply this in this movement? How do we apply this historically in regards to Adventism? The 1863 chart. Right. So this is the 1863 chart. Okay. And, and why is it the image of jealousy? Because it's placing man's wisdom above God's. Yes, so it places man's wisdom above God, and it's in, it, it replaces the 1843 and the 1850 charts. So this is, is man's ideas, um, and we're rejecting light that God directly gave us. So God gave us some light. He gave us over here the 1843 and the 1850 charts. And so now we're going to have here, I'll do it this way. We're just going to, I'll just put the chart. So we have the 63 chart. Now, even though this 63 chart is the image of jealousy, we also know that God at this time established the Seventh-day Adventist church as God's denominated people. So in this first generation, 
Um, you know, so 1850, they established this message. And in 1851, I think is the earliest that we can have references to the Seventh-day Adventist Church being laid to Sia. So it's, uh, and that's James White who actually makes that application. Um, even though the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't technically exist yet, but God's people are, are in a Laodicean condition by 1851. But this we would call the first generation. Now, I know that Jeff, when he talks about the four generations of Adventism, he actually includes Millerite history. He goes back to 1798. Um, I don't, at least in this application here of these four abominations, I mean, we definitely have to see that this is the Philadelphia church and this is the Laodicean church. So there's definitely a distinction between these the group of people here. And so the first generation would be that generation from 1851 uh, to 1888. So I'm just going to put here 51 and 88. So we got 1863 chart and that would be the image of jealousy. Now the next one is the secret chambers and this is going to go from 1888 to 1919. So what would the secret chambers be in this history? Because what, 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 what error develops here? Removing the prophetic heritage. Okay, so that I put here, but I agree with you, it does, it does happen. But I, I still think it begins here. And it, and it creates the room for the rejection of the third angel's message in 1888. But in here, if we look at what's happening here, Ellen White's still alive for most of this history. Um, and the issue that arises, what's the real issue that arises after 1888? So we have the 1888 message, righteousness by faith is rejected. But what comes in? Uh, the daily. Okay, two things. The daily, and it's actually connected with pantheism. And, and I don't know if everybody understands why they're connected. Because um, I've thought about this a little bit. Uh, the daily is the, it's, it's a rejection of uh, the pioneer understanding of the two desolating powers. And, and that's paganism. So it's a rejection that the daily is paganism. But pantheism is a type of paganism. Right? This is, this is a nature worship. And so these two things, the fact that they, even though they're not directly the same thing, uh, they are related. As you come to reject righteousness by faith, as you reject the prophetic foundation, that lays, uh, this lay, the, especially the prophetic foundation, lays uh, the groundwork for the new view on the daily. But the rejection of righteousness by faith uh, creates this pantheism. So there's, there's events that are happening in this history that, that create this. Now we say it's the secret chambers. So the secret chambers, cham chambers is this um, myth, mysticism. How do you spell mysticism? M-Y-S-T. Mysticism. Is that right? No, you've got an I where you put an E mysticism like that yeah yeah that's better thanks i don't have autocorrect on this whiteboard i got instead i got uh, uh dwight there to do that so um so we have this mysticism that comes in which to me is the secret chambers represents that now i also said that the secret chambers represents um this it represents to me chronology, at least in, in this idea when I relate this to the Egyptian temples and, and time. And, and when you look at this history here, uh, especially as you get to the end of it, as they reject the prophetic foundation, as they, they go through this history and they're rejecting prophecy, they start to create uh, a, a way they prepare for what's going to happen in the third generation. And that is they're, they're going to start minimizing. And you see this with the book, uh, 
um, the doctrine of Christ, right? So that's the event here is the doctrine of Christ. Now it's the 1919 Bible con conference, but the doctrine of Christ removes Christ from prophecy and especially all the time prophecies of Adventism. So Adventism now wants to talk about Jesus and it sounds really good, but without prophecy, you don't know who Christ is. And so this 1919 Bible conference uh, also minimizes uh, inspiration, especially as a spirit of prophecy, but also the Bible itself, because it introduces higher criticism. And they open up the way for the education system. Now, here, we're going to have women weeping for Tamas. So, how would we relate women weeping for Tamas? How would we relate that to 1919 and to 1957, to that period of time? Well, it's been really related to being um, a false ladder rain. Okay, a false ladder rain. But I don't know how to apply it to that time period. Okay. How about a how about a false gospel? Okay, false gospel. I would just say it's education. False education, of course, right? So here we have this mysticism come in and, and this mysticism, the thing about it, it, it was addressed. That is, uh, the, the church leadership rejected pantheism, but they accepted the new view of the daily, even though these are really related. And, and 1919 Bible conference, they're also looking at, at this time to, to get uh, doctorate degrees for those that are teaching in our universities and even in, in the areas of theology. So we can see that this is, is turning back to Protestantism, which of course that Protestant education is really a Catholic education. Now, if we understand the relationship between uh, Tammuz and Ishtar, um, so Ishtar is being, uh, the cohort of Tammuz, and we, we see that, that all of this is going back to the Catholic Church. All of this is going back, you know, you've got the Queen of Heaven, which later becomes Mary in the Catholic Church. Um, uh, you have Tammuz sort of replaces Christ. So I know that in, in some, some uh, iterations of this tale, you know, Tammuz is sometimes the daughter of Ishtar, um, and that's how many uh, apply it when they look at the Catholics. But, but the point is that this is all going back to the Catholic Church, ultimately. And, and what it's going to end up doing is leading into the fourth generation. Now, we start the fourth generation in 1957. It doesn't end at the time of the end. The fourth generation still continues on. So we have sun worship here. But the groundwork for what's going to happen in Adventism has already been laid right through this whole history. Now, remember, we, we talk about reform lines, and we know that we had a reform line here. We had a period of darkness, which was the Catholic Church, uh, all the Catholic darkness. We had this reform line. It called Protestants out of this darkness. And then we have the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Millerite movement, uh, developing these truths on the 1843 and the 1850 chart. But then we have Adventism unraveling what has been done. And that happens in every single reform line. You have, you have four generations that follow. And in the fourth generation, you get into the period of darkness. Now, sun worship is, of course, the issue in contrast to the Sabbath. 
right? Because the Sunday is uh, the day of the sun. And, and the Sabbath is God's rest day. But the world is going to uh, create Sunday in honor of, of sun worship. And it's not just that it's about the sun, because all these things obviously have uh, philosophical underpinnings that direct how people act and behave, how they relate uh, to what's happening around them, <coughs> right? So it's not just, you know, that uh, people are worshiping the sun. There's all these principles uh, that have been developed. Uh, I think about a book uh, that Jones wrote. Um, it's called, um, I can't remember the exact title, The Papal Sabbath, The Jewish Sabbath, um, or the Jewish Sabbath, the Papal Sabbath, and the Sabbath of the Lord, something to that effect. And one of the things that he, he illustrates very well is, and, and that Adventists have a, had a hard time understanding, uh, at least maybe intellectually yeah. they understand it, but as far as making an application in their own lives, they've had difficulty with this, is that the Sabbath of the Lord is not legalistic like the Jewish Sabbath. So the Jews added all these laws, all these rules uh, to the Sabbath. And the Catholic Church, of course, they have Sunday, right? That's their Sabbath, so to speak. Uh, the Catholics, of course, what they're doing is they're putting uh, man's uh, works in the place of God. So it's a rejection of righteousness by faith. And there really isn't that much difference between what uh, the rabbis did with the Sabbath and what the Catholics are doing with Sunday. But the Sabbath of the Lord is a sign that God is the one that sanctifies us. And so this always deals with righteousness by faith. Now, in this message, um, we have been very careful in not buying into uh, the perversion of righteousness by faith that has occurred within the conservative ranks, and I say conservative ranks of Adventism. The attack on righteousness by faith that has occurred, uh, because I'm, I'm a student of righteousness by faith. I've read all of Jones and Wagner's books, some of them many times over. Um, and, and, and almost all of the documentation, uh, the 1888 materials, both Ellen White's and also uh, the, all the letters that were written in 1888, um, gone through those quite a while ago, you know, 30 years ago, but uh, whenever they first came out. Um, but the point is, in looking at righteousness by faith, I also studied, you know, the 1888 message study committees materials, um, which they have some good materials. Uh, there was Don Short and, uh, and Robert Wieland, uh, for those that don't know. And, and they wrote some good books. In Search of the Cross is a very good book by Robert Wieland. And um, Then Shall the Sanctuary Be Cleansed is a really good book uh, by Donald K. Short. Um, I haven't read them for a long time. So there might be things in there that I, I never noticed, maybe some errors or whatever. But there was people who came out of there, uh, the 1888 Message Study Committee, um, who had a view on righteousness by faith professing to uh, be teaching what Jones and Wagner taught. But because I had read Jones and Wagner's works, when I would read this material, I would recognize that it's not what Jones and Wagner taught at all. Um, so now Jones and Wagner weren't perfect in everything that they taught, but as far as in righteousness by faith on the nature of Christ, on overcoming sin, those were things that um, were clearly demonstrated um, in, in their writings that can't be misunderstood, but they have been misunderstood and twisted. And so the attack on righteousness by faith really goes back even before Jones and, Jones and Wagner. So I, I just kind of want to walk us through this. So here we had this message, this re reformation, this reform line, and God established truths on the 1843 and the 1850 chart, things like the investigative judgment, this is Christ's sanctuary in heaven, the three angels' messages, uh, uh, the first, second, and third woe, uh, the role of the papacy in end times, uh, 
the image of the papacy uh, and and um, the image like the image of the beast. Um, all these different things were were well illustrated and well understood. And now, when they made the 1863 chart, they didn't realize what they were doing. Um, they simply were were um, in their minds taking the pictures off the 1850 chart and taking the words off the chart and putting them into a book with explanations. Um, so in some ways, the 1863 charts, fine. Now it takes off the 2520, but you still get in the book, uh, 677 BC for the captivity of Manasseh, you still have the starting date for the 2520. It's not taken out of there um, in that way. But the, you know, the 1260 isn't mentioned at all in the book and it's not on the chart. But there is, of course, as we know, in the top right hand corner of that chart, that week of Christ, which God hid the 2520 in that week and also the entire prophetic mirror. But we know that the first angel's message is rejected with the church becoming Laodicea, uh, that fear God and keep his commandments, that, you know, fear God for the hour of his judgment is come, but it's definitely related to fearing God and keeping his commandments. They lose their first love. Right? They go through that whole experience of these churches, um, the, seven, the messages to the seven churches, that all those counsels, uh, negative counsel, is going to apply, but especially to Laodicea, because they're lukewarm, they don't, they're not interested in truth. In this history, Adventists are really into speculation. It's during the time of the gold rush um, and mineral uh, shares uh, are being sold. And people are looking to get rich. That's what ends up happening in this history. Um, so there really isn't, even amongst God's people who profess to keep the Sabbath, there isn't that zeal for God. Now, so when the 1863 chart is made, this is a rejection of the second angel's message. Because Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That is, they start to use a Protestant methodology uh, to, to draw their conclusions. And it happens subtly. Obviously, it develops over here in a larger way. And part of that is to is from a point of trying to be evangelical, trying to evangelize other people, you, you use their materials um, and you try to look scholarly to some degree. But when they get to 1888, the reason why the message of righteousness by faith is rejected has to do with the fact that the first and second angels' messages are rejected. So in 1888, they just don't have the power or the faith in God to actually have righteousness work out in their life. The theory of righteousness by faith is insufficient in and of itself to give a person faith. Now, we know anybody who's been an Adventist for a long time and you start talking about righteousness by faith, it's always about getting to know Christ, that if you fall in love with Jesus, then you won't want to hurt him. That, that's basically the idea. But this is a type of works that is, we somehow think that we have love within ourselves. If we see Jesus, he'll awaken love within us. And there's a truth to this. I'm not saying it's, it's completely error. But somehow we're going to render, because of the love that's in us, we're going to render obedience. But the problem is we don't have faith. You're not going to get to know Jesus and love him without, uh, without prophecy. Because prophecy, we have a more sure word of prophecy. That you do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. If we want to have Christ living within us, we have to study prophecy because it's going to increase our faith. And so I went through a whole experience of years of studying righteousness by faith, but not having the power of it. I could intellectually explain it correctly. I could, I could quote you long passages of Jones and Wagner and Spirit of Prophecy related to it. But my, in my own personal experience, I was much like Jones and Wagner were. They had an understanding of righteousness by faith, but they didn't live it out. And so 
this is what is the result. The result now in this history is a, a mysticism, a type of, of taking the truths of the gospel. And if you read, uh, especially Wagner's material, much more even than Kellogg's, in this period after 1888, he starts to get into this mysticism, into pantheism. And, and the way they tried to start explaining righteousness by faith, um, as you go later into their history, it becomes very airy-fairy. It's not solid. It's not solid biblical things. They're using lots of natural explanations of vibrations of the voice upon sand, upon a, uh, a membrane, and things like this to talk about this, the power of the word and, and so forth. And so it becomes weakened. So even Jones and Wagner who give that message, they start to go away from that message. And, and some of the, the 1888 message study committee, some of it is taking some of their um, mystical ideas that start to creep in and expanding upon them. So we make righteousness by faith a mystical experience. And I'm not a mystic. I don't believe in magic. God does things in reality. He doesn't do things in, in fantasy, which is what mysticism is about. So when we get here to 1919, the groundwork has already been laid, but there needs to be more work done if you want to get into apostasy. And that was the education system. So our ministers in this period of time uh, become very developed. They become very good preachers. They become very good evangelists. And we start to have some world-renowned theologians. We even have Edwin Thiel, who is still the authority on biblical chronology, um, the chronology of the kings uh, of Judah and Israel, even though he's wrong. So, so Adventism receives a, um, an acceptance by Protestants in this history. They, they begin in this history. Definitely when you get to 1957 and you have the book Questions on Doctrine, even the evangelicals accept us as a sort of heterodox type of Christianity. You know, we got some wrong ideas, but we're still Christians. And of course, we see the evangelicals pushing for Sunday legislation. Now, you know, we, we come into this history, so we got 1989, that's not the end of the fourth generation, it's, it's in the fourth generation that the time of the end occurs, that a reform line begins. And, and the reason that this movement was raised up has to do with Sunday that is coming. It's to prepare God's people for what's occurring. And we can see this parallel with Ezekiel. Ezekiel is trying to prepare God's people for the judgment that's coming upon them. Now, that judgment's going to come, but, but they need to repent, at least on an individual level. We know that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. We know that the temple is going to be destroyed. Um, yet, we see that he's still giving a message. He still has to be a watchman, and he still has to give a warning. And that's what's happening with this movement. This movement is being raised up, or was raised up, to be... Uh, a watchman on the walls of Zion. Now, of course, there's lots of other people who believe that they have a message. Um, so we've seen that in, in Adventism. We've seen all these different groups, uh, the Godhead people. Um, we see the people who are trying to push uh, feast keeping. We got the Lunar Sabbatarians. Um, we have different groups teaching uh, righteousness by faith. You have the health message, um, people that believe that the whole purpose of Adventism is the health message. So they have uh, false ideas about health. They go to extremes. A lot of them are new age um, teachings that are adapted and adopted by Adventists. So you'll see Adventists doing uh, different types of therapies that if you research them, you'll find that their, their origins are in Eastern mysticism. Um, and, and some of that could be this, you know, an Eastern asceticism where, you know, you, you somehow can make yourself holy by how you eat. Um, 
and, and how you take care of your body. And these are, are distortions of truth because obviously the health method message is extremely important. Uh, God gave it to be a blessing. Um, and it is also the right arm of the gospel. You know, it opens doors for the body to enter. So we have an entrance through ministering to people's needs. So there's a truth to it. Um, and also we know that when it comes to the Godhead, that uh, the church's position on the Trinity is one that's very mystical uh, on the Godhead. So they have this Trinity, which really, and I wouldn't even call it a Catholic Trinity. It's just some kind of mystical Trinity. It doesn't really make sense. It's inconsistent. You can believe almost anything you want in Adventism regarding the Godhead, as long as it's not understandable. Um, so when I became an Adventist, I accepted what I would call tritheism. That is, we believe there are three different beings in the Godhead, that they're all God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's not a mystical trinity. So different people have different views. My view is that um, it's not an issue uh, that we need to discuss. That's, that's my personal view on that. It's not something that is definitely the message that we have to give to Adventists. That is, we somehow understood the Trinity correctly or the Godhead correctly, you know, we, and rejected what, what has been given to us, that somehow that's going to save us, and it's not. So we have all these different views, you know, whether keeping feast days, um, e even health reform and different forms of health reform, all of these things are not in our reform line. When we look at our reform line, our reform line is a prophetic message. And just as it was with the Millerites, William Miller didn't spend a lot of time discussing all the different doctrines of Christianity. He just presented Bible prophecy. And that is our mission. And so in this fourth generation, if we understand what it is that, that went wrong, because it's really the prophetic foundation, that was undermined, then we have a remedy in our reform line of how to address these four things that have creeped into Adventism. Any thoughts on that part? Because I'm sure you don't all agree with me, 100%. It's gotta be some, some, some things that you would see differently. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm trying to compose my thoughts, so. Okay. One of the points that, that I looked at early on, especially where, where you have the, the 63 chart, mm -hmm. is that much of what was being done there was because of how some of the early pioneers looked at what Uriah Smith had done. Here, here was a person that had gone through this, you know, supposedly scholarly schooling. Mm -hmm. And Smith himself was, was never a true Millerite. Mm -hmm. totally he, his, his belief, especially in the work of Jansenius, was, a, um, was an issue mm -hmm. because he set aside pretty much everything that William Miller had believed. And once they started to go off of that path, when they were setting aside what, what, what Miller had established, it became easy for them to follow, that, follow those other paths as you have outlined. Because Mrs. White is really clear that when there was unity on the subject of the daily, and she places that as before 1844. Mm-hmm. After that, now all of a sudden we have all of the different winds of, of doctrine that have come in, especially on the daily, especially on pantheism, especially on that William Miller was wrong. And that's, that's one of the big things that has been being stated in and out of the Adventist church because they want to set aside what William Miller had to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so a few different thoughts on that. 
so so I agree with you uh, on on these on these points, especially about Uriah Smith, and and that's one of the reasons that we you and I both reject uh, that January twenty fourth, eighteen sixty four article um, as coming from the pen of James White is because it, it refers to Jesenius and James White doesn't use Jesenius but Uriah Smith does. Exactly. Yeah. And Jesenius is not a Christian. Jesenius also died well before 1844. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and it's a good lexicon in, in a lot of ways, but uh, even if you use Jesenius's argument, Uriah Smith misapplies it, um, just saying that it's an adverb. Um, it, it doesn't even, and, and the verses that are referred to don't, don't I'm not going to go into that whole argument there. But, um, but getting back to uh, this idea of what happened in, in Millerite history, because when it comes to righteousness by faith, I know that this is a, a topic that, that can create a bit of emotion for people, um, especially people who've gone through the history that I have with righteousness by faith through the 80s and, and in, into the 90s. Um, that it, I came to the conclusion that righteousness by faith is pretty simple. You have to do righteousness, and it's by faith. It's not by sight. So you trust in Christ for righteousness. But what I saw a lot of things uh, about righteousness by faith is uh, sort of a man working to get to know God so that he would love God enough in order to be righteous so that we, we would actually want to do things. And, and then downplaying upon obedience uh, because because really, righteousness by faith is obedience by faith. So how can you downplay obedience in righteousness by faith? Um, but there's just so many different takes on righteousness by faith. Uh, but I don't see that the Bible ever presents any of those. It presents pretty simple obedience. Uh, that you have to obey God. And, and, and people would just look upon this now as kind of legalism. Um, but it's only legalism if you think that you can somehow win God's favor by obeying him. It's just, it's just the basic requirement of having a relationship with God is obedience. Now, he empowers us to do that. He's worked in our lives. He's taught us things. He's given us the power of his word. All these different things, and you can illustrate them. But it, it should never have been something that uh, was so complicated as people made it out to be. And Ellen White explains righteousness by faith very simply. So it, it's, it's not really an issue. The problem is that because of this apostasy that's happened in Adventism, we end up getting to the point where in 1957, we have rejected the sinful nature of Christ. And, and that opens up the door for uh, sun worship, the acceptance of the papacy. Now, sure, in a lot of this history, there's people in the church fighting what's happening. But as we get into 1989, uh, that battle has pretty much been lost as far as the leadership and the organization is concerned. Maybe on the ground level, uh, you know, a lot of Adventists still believe the truth, uh, but the organization is now opposed to any sort of present truth uh, movement. It's trying to, to position itself at, as the authority upon doctrinal matters, which it never did before 1989. I mean, not in the way that it did after. So in that history, after 1989, the church starts to, to go a different direction, starts to become more authoritarian than it ever had been. Um, and of course, the church we know is going to accept the Sunday. Uh, not everybody in the church, but as far as the institution is concerned, and they're going to do it to try to preserve the institution because there's so much belief in the institution itself that the church has to stand. Uh, they think that if they can conform to the laws and the regulations, that somehow they can avert uh, the government from actually enforcing Sunday observance 
upon Seventh-day Adventists. That's what the, what the church um, is posturing to do. And one example of this, which I presented before, and in 2017, um, when we had Russia uh, confiscating Jehovah's Witnesses' places of worship because Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't conform to uh, the rules regarding evangelism and so forth, um, that Russia had imposed upon all the Christian churches, the Seventh-day Adventist Church put out a statement uh, because there was this rumor that Adventist churches were being confiscated. And they put out a statement that there is no danger of that because the church has, has conformed to the rules put out by the Russian government. And there you see the fact that they would acquiesce things like the ability to evangelize um, uh, others uh, to the government, to, to government decrees, just to preserve their churches. Uh, shows what they would do in a situation where Sunday law would come in. But even more than that, we know that the Adventist church is part of that group that's going to agitate Sunday observance, that they're going to be complicit from the beginning. It's not going to be something imposed upon them. And they somehow think that if they, they work together with uh, the churches bringing about Sunday laws, that, that we can protect ourselves in some way. But of course, just like when the Jews tried to crucify Christ to save the nation, it caused their destruction. And the same thing will happen with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know that went a lot more different direction than your comment, Dwight, but uh, those are the things that came to my mind as we, we were talking about these things. Any, any other thoughts about these four generations, um, the four abominations and how they apply in Adventist, Adventism? And I'm placing them here with the four generations. Not everybody does that um, it, exactly in this way. But uh, that's the way I do it. What about, um, can we apply these uh, after 1989? I think that has been done. Yes. I think they've put from 1989 to 9-11. Right. And then at 9 11, you have the secret chambers, which is spiritualism. They normally point to, to the spiritual formation document. Right. right. Exactly. So even though I place this here, we can now go to 1989 and we can show that there is this progression. And when you get to 9 11, this is spiritual formation. So this is going to be the fourth one. And in 19. 89, I, I place it here that um, the image of jealousy is being set up in the church. And this image of jealousy is, is when we reject prophecy, because this is a rejection of prophecy here in 1989. And, and this battle wages on between uh, the, for lack of a better word, present truth movements that occur within Adventism that are trying to go back uh, to the truth, Hope International, uh, which you know Jeff was involved with, and um, and this this rejection in in and even in 1988, uh, we had the book published by um, uh, George um, George Knight George Knight. Um, which tried to paint A.T. Jones in this really negative sense. And so there was this battle against righteousness by faith that was being waged uh, from 1989 in through the 90s. And, uh, you know, different things that came in, obviously we know that like celebration came in. You know, we went back to the Protestants, we got the celebration movement. And then um, the women weeping for Tammuz I would, I would put this as um, um, in connection with that. Um, but this is basically a lot of these uh, overt movements to combine with the evangelicals. So and that's, that's how I always picture the women weeping for Talmud. This is going back to Protestantism. So, uh, and so the Adventists, obviously they were doing a lot of these things before that because it exists here in this history. But I think you see these things intensified in this history. And then when you get to 9-11, uh, the church itself as an institution has basically 
uh, bought into these things and set itself up that it's ultimately going to accept Sunday worship. Everything that has gone on here in this history has totally undone Adventism to the point that when we see the Sunday come in, Adventists will be behind it. So, so we, we've done this application here and we've done this application here. Um, I still think that there's always a personal application that we can apply these things to our own lives and see um, if we are in apostasy. We could even apply this to our movement itself because um, our movement had this apostasy occur, which ended up in you know, the new movement. So we, we could try to apply those things. Some of these things have to do with meth methodology, education, um, and I'm not going to make all those applications, but, but we can definitely do that if we want to. Now, I'm just going to look at some of the notes here. Yeah, um, Angela says that everybody's always referring to Alexander Hislop's book, Queen of Heaven. And, and that's just because, yeah, when you're going to start looking up this topic, the Queen of Heaven and Thomas, Alexander Hislop's book is definitely one of the most influential books on this topic. It's just a little bit out of date. So there's things in there that aren't correct um, regarding, because we have documents explaining how they believed, uh, which at his time, they didn't have a lot of those documents. They were just starting to uh, translate them. And this is a quote from the General Conference Daily Bulletin, 1891. Some sit in judgment on the scriptures, declaring some passages uninspired because they don't strike their minds favorably. They cannot harmonize scripture with their ideas of philosophy and science, falsely so called. When one presumes to do this, Satan will create an atmosphere for him to breathe, which will dwarf, dwarf spiritual growth. And, and I grew up in that type of environment with my dad being a United Church member or, or uh, minister and, and my grandfather being a Methodist minister and seeing how uh, Christianity had step-by-step -step adopted uh, scientific methods, um, what they call scientific methods, uh, to apply to the scriptures and how science and philosophy uh, this word here is, uh, what was the word there? Yeah, uh, I can't, there was a word I was thinking. Anyway, it, it uh, they harmonize them. So they can't harmonize them. So they reject uh, scripture. And, and so, and, and this has happened again and again. So it's something that, you know, I've always been aware of, which is one of the things when I became an Adventist, I was very, very careful about, um, even though I'm a scientist, I love science, um, you know, especially uh, physics and mathematics and things like that. Um, but I became a, a theist because I studied geology and I recognized that the geological column was best explained by a worldwide flood it couldn't be explained by long ages of slow deposition. Um, so anyway, even though I use science, I still believe that the scriptures are, they have to, we have to test everything by the scriptures. We don't test the scriptures by, by science. I mean, there's a relationship between them because there is a true science. So things have to be based upon reality. That's, that's one thing I guess we can say. Now, Daniel, have you found the date yet tied to the way you interpret the beast's faces? Um, he asked this question. Well, what I think that we're seeing here is we're, we're seeing the date in which he begins his prophesying is attached to what he sees and how these beasts are depicted. So um, I haven't really found anything other than to recognize uh, where the sun is when uh, at the particular dates. So I'm going to be doing a study on that on my own and trying to go through each of these dates and see how they relate to the constellations 
and the messages that are in Ezekiel. And so what I'm saying is that it would be like if we're looking at a calendar and, uh, and let's say we're going to give a message. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily thinking about the calendar, but the time of year it is. And so in the fall, we're going to give a message about the harvest and that Christ is going to come and reap the harvest or, or we need to go out and evangelize because the, the fields are white with heart with, you know, they're ripe. They're white to be harvested. Um, and, and I think that as I go through Ezekiel, I'm starting to see that the dates and the events that occur and the messages in connection with them either strike at particular gods or beliefs uh, connected with that, with those dates or with those signs uh, that exist in the sky. So it's just something that we never saw before. We never thought to look there. We never thought of how somebody living in that time would see that, you know, if the sun's in Leo, for instance, he would know what Leo represents and he would give a message that's connected with that idea uh, because there's a false God connected in some way with that. So, so that's what we're going to look at as we go through Ezekiel. Um, so it's not astrology that we're, we're not, we're not using astrology. We're just recognizing that he is, um, he is somebody who lives in a time when people look at the sky and that what's happening in the sky is connected with his messages that he's giving. And so that when he gives these dates, one of the things he's showing is uh, that God is in control of these calendars. He's giving these prophecies and God's ultimately going to be in control. And the gods that the Israelites were looking to, to save them, aren't going to save them. So, and, and I'm not sure exactly where that's all going to go as we, we, we go through this, because I'm not, I'm not got through everything in all the things we're learning right now is a lot of processing for me. So, um, so any final comments before we close with prayer? Um, you know, uh, there's, you know, there's this uh, question about Bill Lehman and righteousness by faith and the Campus Hill Church and Loma Linda. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with it. One thing I never really did as an Adventist is I never followed what was happening in Adventism. I was always just reading the old books. Uh, I mean, I knew a little bit, obviously, when you had uh, people like uh, Morris Vanden, who was teaching a, a counterfeit righteousness by faith, people like that. And, and you could definitely see the fruit of that. Um, and I knew people who were followers of some of these different uh, ministers. But um, I still think that the answer is, um, you know, in understanding truth is really studying the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Um, and, and Daniel asks, uh, could it be that they are covering uh, cherubs, making known God's will, guiding the wheels? Well, I wouldn't know if they're covering cherubs. The covering cherubs are the ones that are with the ark, but uh, definitely these are angels that are making God's wills known, um, and they're guiding the wheels, which the wheels would be the constellations. Um, so God's will and God's time clock is being controlled by God. That's the way that I would look at it, if, if that answers Daniel's question that he's asking there in the chat. Okay, so let's close with prayer. A dear Father in heaven, we thank you again uh, for this study study time that we have and we're thankful that uh, you've given us your word uh, to study that you've given us your holy spirit uh, to help us understand and that you've placed us here upon this earth and you've given us um, choices to make will we serve you or not and we just ask lord that you can help us as we seek to follow you each day Help us in the little things to be faithful. And we pray for each person with their particular struggles and challenges. We know that the world has an attraction to us. 
Uh, but we also know that this world passes away very soon. And we could easily get caught up in the drama, uh, but we ask, Lord, that we can be caught up uh, to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and see things from your perspective and not from the world's perspective. Be with us until we meet again to study. Um, help us to continue to dig into these things and to understand them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.